everybody. We're going to get started. Again, I'm Rachel Safian. I'm one of the inpatient chiefs here at the University of Washington. And it's my pleasure today to welcome uh, one of our own, Dr. Jonathan Himmelfarb, who will be giving grand rounds today. So Dr. Himmelfarb received his medical degree from George Washington University. He then went on to do his internal medicine residency training at Maine Medical Center in Portland, Maine. He then went to Boston where he did his research training in nephrology at Brigham and Women's Hospital and then went back to Maine for uh, further clinical training in nephrology at Maine Medical Center. Since that time, he has made a research career for himself of international stature. He's been the director of the Maine Medical Center Transplant Program and was its interim chief of medicine and associate chair for research. Uh, he is now the UW Professor of Medicine in the Joseph W. Esbach Endowed Chair in Kidney Research. He is also the director of the Kidney Research Institute. He is recognized nationally and internationally for his expertise in the area of dialysis. He has numerous publications, about 200 hits on PubMed, and he uh, has numerous active grants for which he is the primary investigator or co-investigator. He's made significant contributions to leading renal societies and foundations. He served as chair of the American Society of Nephrology Dialysis Advisory Group and served on the board of advisors of the American Society of Nephrology. He's also served on numerous editorial boards, including Kidney International and the Journal of the American Society of Nephrology. He currently spends most of his time over at Harborview, where he attends um, in precepts in the Harborview Renal Clinic. He is also the mentor to many junior faculty, residents, and graduate students. So it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Himmelfarb for his talk today, entitled Kidney Disease and the Public Health Problems, Progress, and Prospects. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that kind of introduction. It's my pleasure to be here today. I'm going to cover four topics uh, today. Uh, kind of an overview of why we should be concerned about kidney disease and uh, how predominantly over the past decade or so we've come to think about kidney disease as more of a public health and even a global health problem uh, compared to how we used to conceptualize what the major problems in kidney disease are. I'll talk about the development and early uh, 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 metrics and results of really a groundbreaking kidney research institute that was established here at the University of Washington back in 2008. And then I'll focus uh, some uh, attention on two of the many projects that we're doing now at the Kidney Research Institute, one that we call the human kidney on a chip and the other the development of a wearable artificial kidney as a means for renal replacement therapy. In terms of kidney disease as a public health problem, in the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years, uh, there have been a variety of developments that have led us to recognize how common, pervasive, and harmful kidney disease really is. A lot of this had to do with developing better ways to interpret the serum creatinine with respect to kidney function and then standardizing definitions for chronic kidney disease and acute kidney injury. And this led us to recognize that about 10% of the U.S. population, or over 20 million adults, have impaired kidney function or other evidence of kidney disease. According to the Centers for Disease Control, uh, kidney disease, which used to be the ninth leading cause of death, is now the eighth leading cause of death. So we're going in the wrong direction uh, overall. And I'll show you in a bit that in many of the, the really critical areas in kidney disease, there's been a lack of significant progress from a patient perspective over the last several decades. Part of that problem is an inexorable rise in end-stage kidney disease treated with uh, dialysis or kidney transplantation. And whereas uh, in Belding Scribner's day in the 1960s, it really uh, here in Seattle, chronic dialysis started, unfortunately, there haven't been a lot of there hasn't been a lot of real innovation or technological breakthrough or paradigm shift in how we deliver dialysis. So here, 50 years after Belding Scribner, the median survival in the United States for people on dialysis is actually less than three years. And the costs of kidney disease to the federal government has been expanding very substantially, now well above $80 billion per year spent on kidney disease. And I'll go through a little bit of that uh, data with you. 
We lack new, safe, and effective therapies to treat the major problems, the major types of kidney diseases. And compared to many other subspecialties, we lack high-level evidence from randomized clinical trials. These are data from the United States Renal Data System, the last annual data report. The USRDS, or the United States Renal Data System, is congressionally mandated since 1989, and it's a wonderful source of data for essentially everybody in the United States who develops end-stage uh, kidney disease. Basically, if you don't fill out the US RDS forms, then you don't get reimbursed for the care of people with kidney disease, and therefore they have near 100% ascertainment uh, of all the available data related to kidney disease. And what you see in the left-hand circle uh, there are a couple points I would make here. This is looking at the general Medicare population. And one thing is that you see this tremendous overlap between these pervasive chronic diseases which really plague American health care now, namely diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and congestive heart failure. And they're inextricably linked in that many, they, they each are risk factors for each other. They each propagate each other. The treatment of one often complicates uh, the treatment uh, of the other. And collectively, uh, they account for about 39% of the Medicare population, with chronic kidney disease alone, plus end-stage kidney disease, accounting for about 14% of the Medicare population. If you look at the circles on the right-hand side, you see the costs that are associated with the care of those diseases. And here you see that kidney disease, diabetes, and heart failure account for two-thirds of Medicare expenditures in the United States. And kidney disease alone, when you count chronic kidney disease and ESRD, now counts for about a third, about 35%, a little over a third, of all Medicare costs uh, in the United States. So it's a phenomenally expensive disease to treat, and it's linked to diabetes and it's linked to heart failure. These are looking also at USRDS data in terms of uh, patient count. So this is a prevalent patients with end-stage kidney disease. And you see that although the incident end-stage kidney disease appears to be leveling off, so we are having some traction, making some progress in slowing the progression of kidney disease, nonetheless, the prevalent dialysis population has continued to expand. In 1972, when the federal government passed groundbreaking social legislation that authorized ESRD care to everybody who was Social Security eligible, at that time, there were about 7,000 people in the United States that received dialysis therapy. So from that period of time, the last 40-odd years, it's grown from 7,000 people to now six, over 600,000 people. There's some estimates that by the year 2030, there'll be over 2 million people in the United States uh, with end-stage kidney disease, unless we find better treatments that slow the progression of kidney disease. And this is not just a U.S. problem. Uh, these are work by uh, Bernadette Thomas, who's one of our fellows that works uh, with us, who's now uh, working with Chris Murray and colleagues at IHME. And these are the first data really looking at the global growth in dialysis therapy over two decades, from 1990 to 2010. And actually, the rate and growth of the use of dialysis as a treatment for irreversible renal failure is faster outside the United States than it is inside the United States. It's growing particularly <coughs> aggressively uh, in Latin America and in Asia, where the incidence of diabetes related to changes in lifestyle is growing up uh, very substantially. Uh, I was in Shanghai a couple of years ago and was told that 12% of the school age population in Shanghai now is obese. That's 40 million people who live in the Shanghai area. And there are estimates that in mainland China by 2050, there may be 50 million people with end-stage kidney disease unless something changes between now and then. So it's not just a public health problem in the United States, but it's really a global health problem. Now, the biggest problem that we face from a public health standpoint is diabetic kidney disease. Having diabetes alone uh, it results in about a 12-fold increased risk of developing end-stage kidney disease. It's now become the dominant cause of incident end-stage kidney disease. And recently, more than 50% of incident cases of end-stage kidney disease treated with dialysis are due to diabetic kidney disease. Our current treatments can slow progression, but they can't prevent progression. And we've had no additional new therapies introduced that have been both safe and effective 
almost for 20 years now, really since uh, the angiotensin receptor blockers were shown to be efficacious uh, in the very early, late uh, 1990s. And recently, we've had several failed clinical trials that um, were highly publicized, both published in the New England Journal uh, for agents that turned out not to be safe. The Data Safety Monitoring Committee uh, stopped essentially both of these trials for safety concerns. Now, work by uh, Ian DeBoer at the Kidney Research Institute, who's used National Health and Nutrition Examination survey data has really documented the, the rise in the prevalence of diabetic kidney disease in the U.S. population and also shown changing patterns of disease. So we see, it used to, we used to teach that there was a clear-cut set pattern of disease where people would first develop microalbuminuria and then more uh, proteinuria and then hypertension and then you'd see a drop in GFR and then that would progress. But more and more we're seeing people who present only with impaired GFR and not necessarily with microalbuminuria. The reasons for that are not, are not well understood, whether it's related to therapies or changes in the disease. Uh, uh, we're just not sure at the present time. And follow-up work that was done by Miriam F. Carrion and uh, Ian DeBoer, uh, also looking at NHANES data, really came up with something from a public health perspective that's startling. And that's that if you look at the entire U.S. population with diabetes, and it's predominantly type 2 diabetes, and you look at 10-year mortality risks for those that have no manifestations of kidney disease, it's almost identical to the population without diabetes. Whereas with each stage of kidney disease, then the 10-year mortality risks start going up dramatically so that there's a tenfold higher mortality risk if you have proteinuria and impaired GFR than if you have diabetes with no kidney disease. If we express this in a different way, absent kidney disease, there's no increased mortality risk for having diabetes. So all of the excess mortality risk that's associated with diabetes is encompassed by the development of kidney disease. And this has been replicated in two other cohorts for type 1 diabetes as well. Now these are <laughs> the data on the etiology of incident end-stage kidney disease. And again, you see the dominance of diabetes and hypertension, whereas polycystic kidney disease and glomerulonephritis, uh, the incidence of ESRD has been relatively stable over time. So the epidemic of kidney disease that we see is related to sclerosis or scarring in the kidney that results predominantly from diabetes and hypertension. Now, another problem that we never thought of really as a public health problem, but for which our perception is changing quite dramatically, is acute kidney injury. Acute kidney injury is entirely different pathologically and mechanistically than chronic kidney disease. It's really predominantly a hospital-acquired condition, and it's often iatrogenic. It's often related to exposure to nephrotoxic drugs, as well as sepsis and uh, hemodynamic uh, compromise. And these are uh, recently published data showing that the incidence of acute kidney injury requiring dialysis has been going up by about 10% per year steadily for the last two decades in the United States. And if you look at the number of people that are treated with dialysis per year for acute kidney injury, 140,000 people in the US, it's about the same number of people who start dialysis for the treatment of end-stage kidney disease. And whereas the mortality for people starting dialysis with end-stage kidney disease, uh, the, the median survival is about three years, the median survival for people with acute kidney injury uh, is measured in days. So the 28-day mortality is around 30 or 40 percent. So a sizable number, the amount of morbidity, acute morbidity and mortality associated with acute kidney injury has been underestimated because we don't have the same kind of surveillance system nationwide as we do with the United States renal data system for end-stage kidney disease. We're also recognizing now, we used to teach that if you survived acute kidney injury, kidney function would return to normal. Turns out not to be the case. And indeed, uh, studies are showing that up to 25% of cases of end-stage renal disease are precipitated by episodes of acute kidney injury. Recovery is often incomplete. And even when it appears superficially to be good recovery, you activate pathways in the kidneys that are pro-fibrotic 
and lead to the development of chronic kidney disease or accelerate the course of chronic kidney disease. So we're now focusing more and more energy on finding treatments for acute kidney injury. Currently, there are no drugs that prevent or treat established acute kidney injury. Here's a list of the FDA-approved what are called new medical entities or, or new drugs for kidney disease for, for their, uh, the past decade. And there are eight drugs on the list. So the first thing you see is there aren't many drugs, there aren't many new drugs that are approved. And almost all of these drugs are what we would call Me Too drugs. They're very similar to drugs that are already on the market, another erythropoietin stimulating agent or another phosphate binder or a different kind of dialysate solution for peritoneal dialysis. But none of these drugs are going to substantively change the public health implications of kidney disease. And we've not had a major new therapeutic introduced, whether a drug or a device, really in the last two decades that we can say has substantively changed the risks to the public health that are associated with kidney disease. So with this as a background, and the recognition that progress in this field has stalled in the last several decades. People at the University of Washington, in really a visionary uh, effort uh, over a decade ago now, conceived the development of a kidney research institute that would be a clinical and translational research institute focused at a major academic medical center that would focus solely on kidney disease. And this was groundbreaking and really the first of its kind and it came about because of a partnership between the University of Washington and the Northwest Kidney Centers, a not-for-profit dialysis provider that was started by Belding Scribner back 50 years ago. And then I was recruited uh, to the University of Washington in 2008, so six years ago now, uh, to be the inaugural director of the Kidney Research Institute. And I was certainly attracted by the desire for innovation uh, and the desire to really do something substantive that could change the field uh, in coming here in 2008. And the first thing we did is establish a purpose, a mission, and a vision. And the purpose of the Kidney Research Institute is to seek innovative solutions to challenging clinical problems facing people living with kidney disease. What that means to me is that we're going to go after the really difficult problems, the, the thorny areas where there's been no tangible progress for decades, and in some cases longer than that, where if we can have an impact, it will have the greatest effect on the public health and on the majority of people living with kidney disease. The mission is very simple. The mission is to conduct research that can improve the lives of people living with kidney disease. And to me, what that means is that we want to bring the best science to bear on the most challenging clinical problems. So we want to marry the best science with the areas where that science can have the greatest potential uh, clinical impact. And much as in other fields like cancer where the presumption is if you have a serious cancer, you should be in a clinical trial because that's the only way we're going to make progress. That hasn't been the case in kidney disease. In fact, kidney disease is one of the areas where the least randomized clinical trials have been performed over the last half century. So our vision is that every available patient with kidney disease will be informed about, participate in, and benefit from research. So we want our Kidney Research Institute to become part of the fabric of the community of patients and people who care for patients with kidney disease in our community. The way we've gone about this is to build the right clinical infrastructure to support investigators either recruit or train or just work with outstanding investigators that have good ideas. And we're very fortunate here to have such wonderful, bright, uh, young investigators uh, with an interest in kidney disease who really do come up with outstanding ideas. And if we provide them with the right infrastructure and support and facilitate their conducting tests of their hypotheses, then we hope we can meet the mission of improving the lives of people with kidney disease. We did something a little different than most research institutes at the beginning, and that was to say, you know, often with investigators, people say getting them on the same page is like herding cats. Everybody wants to do their own thing. Every, people tend to be highly individualistic who go into research. And we said from the beginning, we're going to try to coalesce investigators to work together in teams to attack 
the major scientific themes that we think relate to the public health. And it turns out that you can do that because people really do want to work on the big problems and they do like working together in teams and if you incentivize people to attack the big problems, uh, you, they really will work on them. So we have focused all of our efforts on five different scientific themes from the beginning until now. And those themes relate to the data that I showed you previously about the unresolved problems in kidney disease. The major cause of death by far for people with all types of kidney disease is cardiovascular. There's tremendous excess cardiovascular risk that's not explained by traditional risk factors and is probably related to the loss of kidney function and the loss of homeostasis uh, and the buildup of uremic toxins throughout the body. So can we understand that better and can we develop novel therapeutics that are directed specifically at the type of cardiovascular risk that's associated with kidney disease. We, want to, we can't prevent acute kidney injury in all cases. Uh, people, the kidney is uh, the, one of the most highly vascular organs in the body. It's very vulnerable to ischemia. There are going to be many clinical situations where the kidney becomes ischemic. But can we attenuate the consequences, both short-term and long-term? Can we improve morbidity and mortality? for those that develop acute kidney injury, and can we prevent long-term development of progressive chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease. Dialysis is a great therapy. Belding Scribner was one of the pioneers uh, of uh, medicine here at the University of Washington and certainly in our field. He won the Lasker Award, very highly prestigious award for developing dialysis as a therapy for irreversible uh, renal failure, but can we do something better 50 years later? Can we provide patients with better choices than the therapies that we have now? We desperately need new therapeutic targets in diabetic kidney disease. Other than inhibitors of the renin angiotensin system and blood pressure control, we have no other therapies that work to slow the progression of diabetic kidney disease. And can we improve healthcare delivery in kidney disease? And there are two problems in particular uh, that we've chosen to attack. One is what's uh, often referred to as kidney disease unawareness. And N. Haynes data shows that about 90% of people in the U.S. with kidney disease say they're unaware of having kidney disease. And even 50% of people with stage 4 kidney disease, which is the stage before you need dialysis or transplant, say they're unaware of having kidney disease. And the other problem that we want to attack are the racial ethnic disparities associated with kidney disease. African Americans are about 12% of the US population and right now they constitute about 37% of the dialysis population in the United States. One of the most stark areas for racial ethnic disparities in healthcare in the US healthcare system. And so we'd like to find ways to improve healthcare delivery that can reduce and hopefully eventually eliminate racial ethnic disparities in uh, outcomes of kidney disease. So we've now, we started out about uh, as a real, as a very small uh, sort of mom and pop research program in 2008 and it's grown very substantially. Over the first six years, uh, we, we set metrics for ourselves and we've had over 500 peer reviewed publications. We've gone from personnel of three or four people when we started up to over 50 now we now have over 50 uh, active funded studies <coughs> and uh, we've uh, had uh, about close to $70 million now in new NIH grant support from 2008 uh, to the present, uh, almost all from the NIH, about 90, 95% of our funding. 90, I would say 90% is NIH and 95% is federal funding. And we really wanted to make the Kidney Research Institute part of the fabric of the community by making this an environment where patients would want to be in clinical studies. We now have in the Seattle King County area over 2,500 patients that are currently enrolled in our various studies and trials. Now, the, I mentioned at the beginning, I, I consider my major job to be to develop the infrastructure that allows people with good ideas to carry out their ideas and see if they'll work. And it's really challenging, and it's really daunting, unfortunately, if, you're, if a young investigator has a great idea to test that, uh, in a clinical setting, you need to have a lot of pieces in place to test that idea. You have to have access to, this, to a population that has the condition you're interested in. 
you have to have the clinical informatics, what we sometimes call a clinical data warehouse. You have to have biosamples and kidney disease. If you can't measure something, you're really not going to be able to make progress. So you need biofluids or biosamples, tissue samples, often to test your idea. You need to be able to track clinical outcomes. And you have to rest all this on a strong bedrock, bedrock of bioinformatics and biostatistics and laboratory medicine. And so we, have, we need to do, there are seven, really seven different components to this. And we had to build these sort of all on the fly as we were initiating our studies. And this kind of infrastructure is only as strong as the weakest link in the chain. So you can have everything but one component in place and you really can't do much. If you don't have access to patients or data or biosamples or strong ability to analyze data and or biosamples, you really can't do much. So we have worked hard to build all different, all seven components of this infrastructure simultaneously while getting our 50-odd studies off the ground over the last six years or so. One of the groundbreaking things that we did is develop a registry and a biorepository. And the goal here is to empower patients and their families to participate in research. So uh, we worked iteratively with the uh, Institutional Review Board to develop a sort of far-reaching uh, uh, registry and biorepository. And by signing a consent to the registry, in essence, what a patient is saying is, I would like to be informed about any research studies you're conducting at the Kidney Research Institute for which I might be eligible. So uh, I may choose to participate, I may choose not to participate, but I would like to be informed and I would like to make the decision uh, rather than my caretakers necessarily informing me that they think I'd be good, uh, it would be appropriate for a given study, I'd like to make those decisions myself. And in so doing, I'm happy to provide you with access to my medical records and perhaps biosamples that can help you in your research efforts. So this has been very successful. We've created a number of different modules where we collect different kinds of bio information and biosamples depending on the nature of the disease that we're studying. We now have over 2,000 subjects that are enrolled in the registry in the biorepository. So I'll give a, a short, very quick kind of top 10 list of ongoing studies now. We have a number of studies that are looking at human genetic variation in acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, and ESRD outcomes. Uh, we've done a number of studies and just completed a four-center randomized clinical trial uh, examining whether improving or, or having a healthier lifestyle can change the metabolic milieu that's associated with chronic kidney disease and make it less pro-atherogenic. And uh, results will be pending shortly. We've discovered several novel pathways of vitamin D uh, metabolism and uh, shown how they're relevant uh, to kidney disease. Uh, we're conducting randomized trials of anti-inflammatory therapies because inflammation is concomitant with almost all types of kidney disease in the dialysis population. We're testing in randomized trials novel strategies for preventing medication dosing errors, developing novel early biomarkers of diabetic kidney disease uh, using proteomic and other techniques. We'd like to be able to look in the urine 10 years before somebody develops microalbuminuria and say this person is destined uh, to get diabetic kidney disease. What can we do early on that would be preventative instead of uh, treating after the fact? We're assessing the importance not so much of urea or creatinine, but there are a whole variety of uh, more novel uremic toxins or retention products that have vascular and other toxicities and trying to understand the mechanisms by which they're toxic. Uh, we just started, uh, just received funding for a novel pragmatic clinical trial, multi-center clinical trial to treat depression uh, in dialysis patients. And then the two projects that I'll focus uh, the remaining part of the talk on are the development of a human kidney on a chip and the development of a wearable artificial kidney. So uh, before letting you know what a kidney on a chip is, why a kidney on a chip? Well, uh, first of all, the, the rationale for developing human organs on chips really came from the NIH, from the FDA and DARPA that are collaborating. Because as Francis Collins has said repeatedly, the drug 
uh, discovery and evaluation process in the United States is broken. So 90% of drugs that go into clinical trials fail in the United States, and 50% of drugs that go into phase three clinical trials, which are expensive and also expose patients to those drugs who are altruistic and volunteering to be part of research, uh, fail. And they fail for one of two reasons. They either fail because the drug is effective at treating the disease that it's supposed to treat, but in clinical trials you discover what are called off-target effects, which means that a drug that's supposed to help the liver hurts the heart, or a drug that's supposed to be good for heart disease affects the GI tract in some way. So uh, off-target toxicities are often not picked up in preclinical animal model studies. The second problem is that there are many drugs that are effective in animal models that are simply not effective in human beings with the disease uh, process. So the uh, NIH announced a goal to create human organ mimetics on tissue, microphysiological tissue chips where you could test drugs and evaluate toxins as well, environmental and other toxins, on human cells. And if you could mimic the function of a human organ, you could test something on this chip before you put it into clinical trials. So the goal would be to uh, maximize the efficiency of clinical trials, reduce the cost of clinical trials, and reduce the cost thereby of medications, uh, stop exposing uh, patients to agents in clinical trials that may turn out to be harmful, and also reduce the need for animal models in the development of therapeutics. So we propose to develop a kidney on a chip for several reasons. One, the kidney is involved in the elimination of about a quarter of all drugs and their metabolites. Uh, secondly, the kidney, because it concentrates drugs, the 50-fold to 100-fold in kidney cells as part of the elimination process, those cells become very highly susceptible to injury from drugs, and the kidney is one of the organs that often is, uh, unfortunately, the result of off-target toxicities. People with kidney disease are at greatly increased risk of adverse drug reactions, and up to 20% of hospital admissions for acute kidney injury are due to drug-induced injury, and it's estimated about 25% of acute kidney injury in the ICU setting is due to drug toxicity as well. And as previously mentioned, few new drugs have become successfully developed for the treatment of kidney disease. So we proposed to develop a, the part of the kidney, the tubular interstitium, that is the most responsible for the handling of drugs, the elimination of drugs and their metabolites, and also the part of the kidney that is most susceptible to drug-induced injury and to toxic effects. And so to do this, we... The kidney is the most complex organ in many ways in the body. Architecturally, also has the most different cell types of any organ in the body. So we said we're not going to try to build a human kidney entirely on a chip, but we're going to build the critical part, the tubulo interstitium. And to do that, we need three different types of cells. We need the proximal tubular epithelial cells that line the proximal tubules. And then we need to mimic the peritubular microvasculature and for that, we need peritubular microvascular endothelial cells and perivascular cells so that we could bioengineer a microvessel and we could bioengineer a kidney proximal tubule. And this is histology of a normal kidney. And in green, you see the tubules. In a healthy kidney, there's very little in the interstitium, the space between the tubules. Very, very a few cells and very little extracellular matrix. But the tubules are all surrounded by vessels. Every, the kidney is such a vascular organ, and the rates of solute transport from the vasculature through the tubules is just amazing. It's really often equal to renal blood flow rates, which can be 500 cc's per minute. And in terms of trying to understand kidney drug and toxin clearance, for 100 years now, since Homer Smith first described the relationship of glomerular filtration to tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion, the, back, the black box has always been tubular secretion. That's been, nobody has yet made a model, been able to model right, going from in vitro uh, scaling up to in vivo to understand tubular secretion of drugs and toxins. So we said if we could mimic this part of the kidney and we could create a model for tubular secretion that could advance the entire field. 
So <clears throat> we were fortunate to be funded and have started this project a couple of years ago. Uh, and this just shows our cell source is predominantly from people who are undergoing nephrectomy for a circumscribed cancer where the rest of the kidney is normal. And with consent, we isolate cells from the rest of the kidney using flow cytometry and other approaches. Uh, this is just actually showing the architecture in the kidney of the microvasculature. You can see how it surrounds all the tubules and then these perivascular cells. And when you overlay them, you see these perivascular cells are always at the branch points where they can control the vascular microcirculation. So we isolate these cells, and then we're working with a small startup company called Nordis that came out of UW Bioengineering and is supported by the Center for Commercialization. Their headquarters are in Fluke Hall over a couple hundred yards from here on the UW campus. And they make these uh, tiny uh, tissue microperfusion chips that are very well designed to allow, they're highly biocompatible and they allow us to mimic a microenvironment complete with both flow inside a lumen this way. Right in here is where we make our tubules and our microvasculature. It's about 70 nanoliters in volume, so about a thousandth the size of a drop of water. And we can flow things through it, but we can also mimic interstitial flow and lymphatic flow by flowing fluids in a, in a fashion this way as well on these tissue microperfusion chips. So we set out to build this uh, kidney on a chip or kidney tubular interstitium on a chip. And the first thing we asked are what are the performance requirements for this to be successful? And we need to be able to mimic all the physiologic and pathophysiologic function of the tubular interstitium. So here talking about the tubule, we got to first have viable cells. We got to physiologically reabsorb glucose, uh, kidney injury molecule expression. We have to show an appropriate uninjured phenotype for the cells. That we have synthetic function, transporter function, and especially organic anion cation secretion through a polarized epithelia, the way that the kidney normally would be. So we set a high bar. And uh, this is uh, a different kind of grant. This is driven by milestones, and it's really highly uh, <laughs> focused on uh, productivity. And in the first two years, we've consistently be, been able to make, here you see one of our uh, highly magnified, you see one of our kidney tubules. This is uh, on a chip 28 days out. Uh, so you get long-term culture. They maintain an epithelial phenotype. The green here stains something for tight junctions called ZO1. The red here is uh, cadherin, shows they're maintaining an epithelial phenotype. And here you see a high level of cell viability 28 days out. This you would not see with standard uh, cultures. You, when you put kidney tubule cells into a standard culture, they undergo a transition. It's called epithelial mesenchymal transition. And they, do, they behave more like fibroblasts than like tubules. So this allows, just this alone allows you to test long-term exposure of kidney tubule cells to various drugs and toxins. And we've been able to show here standard 2D culture where there's not much expression of uh, the glucose transporter. There are now drugs targeting for diabetes, SGLT2, which is involved in glucose reabsorption. It's not highly expressed, whereas injury molecules are, Kim one here. But when we put these in 3D devices, there's almost no kidney injury, uh, and yet there's robust uh, polarized expression of SGLT2. So they mimic in vivo functionality of cells much better. In terms of synthetic function, uh, Ian DeBoer and Ken Thummel from Pharmaceutics over the last five years have really discovered novel pathways for vitamin D metabolism. I always thought vitamin D metabolism was pretty simple. You absorbed it through the skin or you ingested it. The liver converted uh, vitamin D to 25-hydroxy vitamin D and the kidney, the 1-alpha-hydroxylase or CYP27B1 converted that to activated vitamin D. And that's all I knew five years ago about vitamin D. Turns out there are at least three different pathways for metabolism of different end products with different biological activities in the kidney alone, plus there are sulfation and uh, glucuronidation pathways that change the biological behavior of vitamin D. We're now exploring this whole concept both in the kidney on a chip and in, uh, with other techniques, including uh, human studies with labeled vitamin D as well. 
But when we add 25-hydroxy uh, vitamin D to our kidney on a chip, we can show biotransformation by the production of the end metabolites of all three different enzymes, which we can also show are physically in the kidney on a chip. So here's the 1-alpha hydroxylase, the CYP24 enzyme, and the end products of CYP3A4 metabolism as well. So all enzymatic function within the kidney uh, is active. We can show physiologic response to stimuli. The kidney... Uh, when to excrete an acid load and maintain acid-base homeostasis increases the production of ammonia from glutamine, and then the hydrogen ion binds to ammonia to form ammonium, and that's excreted by the kidney. If that process is defective, you get something called renal tubular acidosis, and acid builds up. And we show when we lower the pH, then we dramatically increase the renal tubular production of ammonia in the system. Then we've shown that they have polarized transport function and that so-called uremic toxins can inhibit the secretion of other substrates, including drugs, uh, through these uh, basal lateral uh, transporters as well. So we've been able to really recapitulate all known physiologic uh, function of the proximal tubular epithelia in these tiny little uh, kidney tubules on chips. We then turned our attention to the microvasculature, and here... Uh, we had a different set of performance characteristics related to vascular function uh, that we wanted to achieve. And we first had to learn how to isolate human kidney microvascular cells, and this was non-trivial to isolate endothelial cells in human perivascular cells, have them maintain the right phenotype and gene expression that hadn't been done before. And then in work led by Ying Zheng from Biomedical Engineering, uh, she has just built these fabulous vascular networks uh, of human kidney uh, microvasculature that maintain a phenotype. They have flow-directed uh, uh, formation of the endothelia. They're still, 28 days out, highly differentiated. The endothelial cells still express von Willebrand's factor. And here you see sort of exquisitely these perivascular cells around the microvascular cells forming and at the inflection points of these capillary networks that she develops. And then we've been able to, it's been speculated, but it hadn't really been studied. It's been speculated that the human kidney peritubular microvasculature is probably fenestrated, has holes in it to allow this very vigorous, efficient mechanism uh, for clearance of molecules out of the vascular into the tubules. And we've been able to take these human kidney uh, microvascular cells and show that they actually develop these holes and show that they are leaky in the way that we, we would expect. And then as a disease model, we expose these vessels to cyclosporin in concentrations that are physiologically relevant, and within an hour, uh, this otherwise normal vessel suddenly looks completely deranged, and you see red cells and labeled platelets adhering to the luminal surface uh, of the vessel. It actually pokes holes in the vessel, and you start to see we have these uh, movies that I didn't dare show because I didn't want a technical failure during grand rounds, but we can actually show the red cells uh, egressing and kind of like rouleau outside the vessel uh, into the interstitium. So the summary is that we can now robustly reproduce and validate physiological function for the first time We've really uh, purified kidney microvascular cells. We've, for the first time, bioengineered these human kidney microvessels. We had two UW undergraduates in a summer project take human kidney matrix and form it into a hydrogel that could be used in these tissue microperfusion devices. Really amazing uh, working at South Lake Union. We've been able to quantitate for the first time human kidney transporters, and we're now developing signatures that we think will accurately predict kidney toxicity for the first time before you go into clinical trials. Uh, we're working to really be able to create the first model since Homer Smith for in vitro to in vivo scaling uh, of human tubular secretion and developing a systems pharmacology approach to understanding a drug metabolism in the kidney. And also quite exciting, this whole consortium is very exciting, and we're now beginning to integrate the kidney module with a liver and an intestine module so we can replicate all aspects of understanding drug absorption, disposition, metabolism, and elimination. So we're working with a group. It's really a, a, a gut group from Johns Hopkins. Mark Donowitz runs the Center for Epithelial Cell Biology at Hopkins, is developing a gut on a chip. 
We're working with a group at Pitt and Mass General that are developing a liver on a chip. We're developing a kidney on a chip. And a systems engineering group at Vanderbilt is helping us put all of these together into one system so that we will be able to really study drug disposition and metabolism in a completely different way in the future. The total volume of the circuit when we're done will be less than 50 microliters. So it's really a technological feat to do this. Uses of this, we think, for drug development, it'll be a tool for understanding uremic toxins and how they affect tubular transport. We think we can use this as a great model for developing new organ preservation fluids to, uh, for kidney transplantation, and then for understanding cell-cell interactions and kidney development and for organogenesis. So switching topics in the last few minutes, Belting Scribner was the pioneer who started chronic dialysis. I don't think he ever envisioned dialysis today, where there are about 60 million treatments performed in the United States, and it's really become institutionalized uh, in many ways. Every, it seems like you know, every other street corner in the United States will have a dialysis unit on, on it, maybe next to a McDonald's. And uh, it has its own infrastructure, and it is life-sustaining, uh, but the question is, can we do something better for patients? Now, we've known forever that dialysis is unphysiologic. Three times a week dialysis, levels of the solutes go down precipitously. They slowly come up over 48 hours. They come down over four hours. They go up. And that's true for osmolality, electrolytes, fluid balance, and that this is not healthy. And the more frequently dialysis performed, we start to approach continuous dialysis, which is what native kidneys do 24-7, even while you're sleeping. The FDA recognized the lack of innovation in dialysis therapy over the last half century, really since the 1960s, and issued a challenge in 2012 that they called the Innovation Challenge, which was a pilot program for innovative devices that could address ESRD, uh, where they wanted to be able to work with inventors to bring technology forward as opposed to more of an adversarial role, which is often the way the FDA uh, works with, particularly with uh, device innovators. So we submitted an application. There were 32 applications. Three were chosen to be part of this pathway. The team is Seattle-based, and the first clinical trials of a wearable artificial kidney will be conducted here starting hopefully this fall. The device is really miniaturization technology, so in many ways it's not uh, rocket science any more than the Scribner shunt the building Scribner invented was not that complicated. It was just innovative use of biomaterials for a purpose that hadn't been used before, uh, along with Wayne Quinton. And this is really miniaturization technology to develop a dialysis machine that instead of weighing 100 pounds and being this tall, weighs about 10 pounds and can be worn on a belt. And there are some innovative features to this that allow for the miniaturization. One is to go back to a very old technology that purifies the dialysate. So one of the challenges if people are going to walk around getting dialysis is standard hemodialysis now, the dialysate flow rates, the purified water flow rates, if you will, about 500 cc's a minute. So a four-hour treatment consumes 120 liters of pure water. 24 hours would be 700 liters. Nobody can walk around carrying 700 liters of water in a day. <clears throat> so the innovative thing is to go back to a very old technology that actually purifies the dialysate. So if this is the blood flow, dialysate flow is always in a countercurrent direction to blood flow. And what's normally would go down the drain, what's called spent dialysate after it's been filled with uremic toxins, now goes over a series of columns that turns this again into ultra-pure water. So that the entire circuit now has 100 cc's of water for 24 hours instead of uh, 720 liters of water, let's say. And there's been innovation in the pumps. These are two standard dialysis pumps. This is the wearable artificial kidney pump. It actually outperforms these pumps because of some no novel technologies in the pumps. <coughs> so uh, we, as mentioned, we hope uh, we just received IRB approval actually last week uh, to start these trials here at UW. A lot of hypothesized benefit to continuous dialysis therapy, uh, which are only hypothesized at the present time. And there are also quite a few risks that need to be assessed with 24-7 dialysis. And so we're very carefully and rigorously going to conduct trials of what could be a paradigm-shifting therapy. 
this is uh, the, uh, these are two pictures from a small pilot study of this device that was conducted in Europe a number of years ago. And this is a mother and a daughter, both of whom have polycystic kidney disease, both of whom have end-stage kidney disease. Mother being conventionally dialyzed in bed, daughter wearing, hard to see, and this is really a prototype way back of uh, a wearable artificial kidney, coming in to visit her mother. And you can see from her expression the <laughs> The potential liberating aspect for people, if they're not tethered to a machine, if they can get their therapy and do their activities of daily life and go around living, what a paradigm shift this potentially could be for dialysis patients. So I'll end uh, with a quote from uh, Yogi Berra. It's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> it's been uh, my pleasure, really, an honor to be here uh, and a privilege the last six years to get this, uh, uh, to start the Kidney Research Institute. And we don't know where we're going. We're hoping we'll, uh, we'll complete the mission of conducting research that can improve the lives of people with kidney disease. But at this point, it's still very much a work in progress. And I'll end with, um, I had some trepidation in making this slide yesterday because I know I'm going to leave some people off. Uh, but there are so many people to thank, and I really feel privileged to have uh, been able to be here the last six years and work with really outstanding people uh, with the Kidney Research Institute. I'll start with the visionaries who really thought this through way before it started. Stuart Shanklin, the nephrology division chief, really partnered with Joyce Jackson, the CEO of the Northwest Kidney Centers, and without them, none of this would have happened. We have a great faculty that at, uh, on the Harborview campus that we work with, terrific ideas, wonderful investigators, great personnel that we have, our lab staff, our data analysts, our administrative staff, our research fellows are terrific. Our Kidney on a Chip team is uh, mostly from bioengineering, from Nordis, the startup company, but especially from the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutics. They've just been terrific to work with. Our wearable artificial kidney team, I would, uh, Larry Kessler in particular, has been a, a terrific partner from the School of Public uh, Health in this effort, and then many, many collaborators from many different disciplines who work with us on many different projects. So thank you very much for your attention. And first, thanks. I'm intrigued by the kidney on a chip. Mm -hmm. So these are extension questions about it. So, so the first is, are you able to put a diseased kidney on a chip? Yeah. And then the second is, just thinking about the cyclosporin example and how horrible it looked, would that prevent you from picking cyclosporin to a, a clinical trial? Um, and how, how do you envision using these data in the context of something yeah. that um, is actually an incredibly effective medicine and one can uh, you know, have a dose-related kidney toxicity that one can look for and, and deal with? So those are two great questions. So the first question was, can you use these organs on chips to create disease models? And that's clearly a goal. Uh, and uh, uh, of the kidney on a chip and really all the different organ systems on chips. So yes, uh, we would like to actually also create a glomerulus on a chip, and we're starting to do that so we could look at glomerular diseases and, and create disease models where you could test therapeutics and even develop high-throughput screens for novel therapeutics. And certainly for acute kidney injury, the toxicity, we think we can do that even with what we have right now. So the goal is very much to disease model with these organs on chips in addition to looking for off-target effects. It's to look for efficacy. The second question is how, where, it's kind of a, a question a lot of people are asking right now, and that's where will this, these rapidly developing new systems fit into the menu or, of choices uh, for how you develop new therapeutics? Where will this fit in with animal models and clinical testing? Will they be too sensitive? Will they be not sensitive enough? Um, I just got back from a meeting at the National Academy of Sciences on this uh, three weeks ago. The FDA is holding conferences every year. On, everyone is trying to figure out how these or how well will these organ systems perform. And ideally, they will tell you about off-target toxicities that weren't picked up in animal models, 
uh, so that you would really get new information uh, from them. But could they be too sensitive? Because as you say, cyclosporin is an effective therapeutic. It is toxic. And no question that uh, the major uh, target organ is the kidney. Uh, so it is a toxic drug, but it's also an effective drug. So there's always a risk balance benefit of uh, toxicity versus efficacy. And will these, organ will these organs on chips improve that uh, risk benefit assessment over time? It's an open-ended question right now. Thank you. Okay, the quiet group.